patient, when we have a stable patient, we're going to give medicine. When we have an unstable patient, what I call is we're going to give Edison medicine. So we're going to give electricity. Uh, so as opposed to doing a big giant mega code and have you stress all it, as we go through some of these rhythms and stuff, I'm going to give you a scenario and we'll get through it together, whether it's a stable or unstable patient. And I promise you'll do fine, man. You're going to do awesome. So atropine, like I said, don't give it slow. Give it fast. If you give anything less than 0.5 milligrams, it'll worsen the bradycardia too. So if you give it slow or if you give less than half a milligram, you'll make it worse. So whoever's drawing up your meds before they give them, confirm, hey, that's at least a milligram of epi, right? Or, or of atropine, right? Yep, milligram of atropine. Mm -hmm. All right, slam it. Don't, don't, don't be shy. Don't give it slow. Okay. Remember, it's not morphine. Morphine we give slow, otherwise they're going to start sure. throwing up all over us, right? That's right. <laughs> I, I hate that. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, IV, uh, IV axis is preferred over IO in the field. Uh, you know, when someone's in circulatory collapse, man, you just can't find a vein, bro. So what we, we do in the field all the time now, we don't even look for veins. We just drill them right away. Uh, but they're saying now to try and find an IV. But when they're in, in cardiac arrest, they don't, there's no uh, blood pumping through the veins. It's almost impossible. So, but they're saying, try and find an IV first, which you guys at the hospital, that's all you do. And you have doctors that can do central lines, which is awesome, man. We can't do that. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, 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 uh. Multinodal. This just talks about like uh, the post cardiac arrest patient, like how to deal with them, the depression and the survival guilt and blah, blah, blah. Nothing we need to really go over. All right. Drugs and what they're given for. If you remember, um, adenosine, adenosine is given for stable uh, atrial rhythm rates that are fast. So our SVTs and our sinus tacks, we're going to give adenosine. The dose is six milligrams, 12 milligrams, and 12 milligrams. Usually, uh, if I give my second dose of adenosine and I don't convert them, there's no use in going to the third dose because you know it's not going to work. Um, <clears throat> amniodarone, this is where it gets confusing because we have a live dose and we have a dead dose of, of amniodarone. If we have a patient with pulses and has any kind of ventricular rhythm, uh, mm -hmm. runs a VTAC, uh, uh, ven uh, ventricular tachycardia, um, uh, 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 VTAC with pulses, right? Any pulse producing mm. ventricular rhythm. And we know it's ventricular because of the wide QRS. We'll go over that. We're going to give amniodarone. They're alive. So we give the live dose when they're alive. We give 150 milligrams in 100 cc's of normal saline as an infusion over 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So amniodarone live dose 150. That's one vial over 100 in 100 milligrams of cc over 10 minutes now we're working a cardiac arrest we're pulseless v tax um uh, ventricular fibrillation any ventricular rhythm in origin uh, that the patient is not producing a pulse we're going to give the dead dose for amniodarone our first initial dose or dead dose of amniodarone is 300 milligrams so that's two mm. vials of amniodarone as a bolus, we're going to slam it. We're going to circulate it for two minutes doing CPR. Then we're going to, you know, after the two minutes, it comes to a shock. Uh, we give our epi, circulate it for two minutes, shock. Mm -hmm. Now we give amniodarone again. Now our second dose, our dead dose, is 150 milligrams given as a bolus. It gets confusing. It gets confusing, mm -hmm. right? They, they can't Fun. make it easy. Yeah, so they have the dead dose and the live dose. So if you just remember, if they're alive, give it slow. If they're dead, give it fast. Uh, aspirin, nothing changed there. Four uh, baby aspirin, chewed and swallowed, uh, maximum of 324 milligrams. Atropine changed from 0.5 to 1 milligram, max of 3 milligrams. Cardiazem, we're going to give it for new onset, a fib, a flutter uh or any fast uh you can give it for uh fast atrial rhythms as well um i, I know you guys give it in the mm -hmm. hospital still right cardizem like quite a bit absolutely 
Yeah, 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 yeah. We used to give it pre-hospital. We don't so much now, but whatever. Dopamine, I've been working in the field for 28 years, 29 years. I've never once used it pre-hospital, but I know you guys in, in the hospital use it all the time. Uh, one of my other jobs, I work transport, and we would routinely transport patients from one hospital to the next. And they'd, be, they'd be hanging a dopamine drip. What we always say with dopamine, because it's such a confusing drip to memorize, we just titrate to effect, right? <laughs> um, epinephrine, uh, standard dose, right? One milligram every three to five minutes. There's no max on that. You, by the next time you get ACLS again, they're probably going to change it. Lee County EMS and all the Lee County fire departments um, what we're doing now is 0.5 milligrams of epi every three to five minutes to a maximum of two milligrams. So they've decreased the dose substantially. American Heart did this study and they figured out that epinephrine is actually killing these patients when they get ROSC, that all those mm -hmm. vasopressors in the heart is just like exploding the heart. So we're there. You'll see uh, when they get more test subjects that they're probably going to go away from epi or decrease the dosage substantially. So just be, but for now it's one milligram every three to five minutes. No, no, oh. uh, no limit on that till mm -hmm. the cows come home. Lidocaine. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, that's a drug we brought back. Uh, uh, one to one and a half milligrams per kilogram max. Uh, there's no max on that. Just your first and second dose. Mag sulfate, we give this for persistent or resistant uh, VFib. We've gone through the entire algorithm. We've given this guy five shocks, all the epi, all the lidocaine. We're down to uh, amniodarone. We've given him everything, and he just won't convert. Now we hang, we hang a mag sulfate drips, and that's and given it its total of two grams in uh, uh, 100 cc's of normal saline, and that's an, an infusion as well, right? So uh, per resistant VFib or torsades is the points, which I've never seen. I don't, you've probably seen it in the hospital. But I've, I've never seen it pre-hospital. Uh, nitro, it's not given as a drip like you guys give it. You, I know you guys give it in a paste as well. We give it sublingual as a spray. It used to be to we would only give three sprays of nitro uh, to a limit, uh, uh, to a max dose of 0.12 milligrams. Now they're saying as long as the patient has pain and the systolic blood pressure is above 90, we can give nitro uh -huh. until they're pain free, which is kind of cool because before, you know, uh -huh. I, I transport patients and they still have a five or a six pain scale. They have, they would have a solid blood pressure, but we were limited on how much nitro we could give them. So that's kind of cool. Oxygen, you know about that. Mm -hmm. uh, procainamide, uh, it's, it's been in the algorithm forever. Uh, you've probably seen it given to the hospital. Um, it's been around since I first started. I've personally never given it. Uh, and the only place I think I've seen it is like an ICU where they hang all these crazy drips like you guys do. Um, but that's really about it. I'll go over it, but they rarely give it in codes. I've worked in hospitals as well. They, they rarely give it. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Sodium bicarb, we give this to patients if they're uh, metabolically ac acidotic, if they've been down or they've been working them for a super long amount of time, we're just not circulating the blood the way we need to. We give them the sodium bicarb. It's basically the whole amp. It comes out to one milli equivalents per kilogram, 100 pound patient or 100 kilogram patient. We give the entire amp. <clears throat> uh, saddle all we give that for uh, uh, beta blockers or SVT. Uh, it's in the algorithm, but it's not really given a whole lot. Uh, mm -hmm. All right, all right. So, all right, adenosine. I'll go over the indications. Right, uh, they give for an SVT for a rate. What they're calling is a PSVT or an SVT is a rate greater than 150. So if you see an atrial rhythm at around a rate of 130 to 140, it's just considered a sinus tack to where if you have a rate greater than 150, now it's considered uh, a supraventricular tachycardia. So, Remember, the, the QRSs are narrow. We'll go over rhythms recognition, which you're, I'm sure you're great at. We'll just go over those real quick. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, uh, uh. Right. Nothing there, nothing there. Contraindication, so adenosine, second and third degree AV blocks, obviously because that's lower than the atria. We're working directly on the SA node with adenosine. Uh, dose, uh, the dose 6, 12, and 12. This is a short-acting drug. It has a half-life of 30 seconds. Uh, so we want to start a large-bore IV. 
uh, 18 gauge or larger in the right wow. AC, right AC, because it's a more mm -hmm. direct pathway to that right atrium. Uh, what I do is I put both needles in the same port or uh, I put my adenosine in the lower port and a, a flush of 10 cc's in the higher port, pinch the tubing, obviously slam the, ten, the six milligrams of adenosine and then immediately slam the 10 cc of the normal saline just so that medicine will get to the heart faster. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll see that little wave of asystole breaks down. The patient says, oh, I don't feel too good. And then it'll kick back up or it'll convert. I haven't, I've converted maybe half my patients from adenosine. It, it's, it's hit or miss if you're going to get them or not. Uh, but I know if I don't convert them with the second dose, I'm not going to go to a third dose. If they start to become symptomatic, pale, cool, diaphoretic, chest pain, shortness of breath, that, that constitutes a symptomatic patient. I'm going to give, I'm going to give medicine. I'm going to give Edison medicine. I'm going to give electricity. Remember for fast, uh, eight true or for fast rates for an unstable patient, whether it's sinus or ventricular in origin, we're going to do synchronized cardioversion. You remember that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the most important thing to do when you do synchronized cardioversion is to always, always, always hit the sync button, right? Because if you're not, you're just randomly delivering electricity, you're going to do an R on T phenomenon and then now take them into V-fib. That's right. <laughs> I've actually seen that. I, you laugh, but I've actually seen that, man. So every time you deliver the energy, right, you got to re-hit the sync button. And cardio version, uh, do you, are you guys using Zoles or still life packs in the ICU? No, we use um, life pack. Okay. All right. Those are monophasic monitors, uh, meaning that the electricity isn't as effective um, um, because it doesn't flow in two different vectors as opposed to the Zoles. They've done a whole bunch of studies on this. We just recently switched to the Zoles because they're just such a better, better monitor, man. So the mm -hmm. life packs, what happened is the majority of electricity is being given to the top of the uh, endocardium and not so much to the, in like a posterior part of the heart. So not the entire heart was getting the same amount of electricity. That's why they switched to biphasic monitors. Biphasic monitors, electricity shoots from the bottom, goes to the top, and then shoots right back down again at a split second to where the monophasic, the life packs, just shoots from the bottom up to the top and nothing else happens, right? So they, okay. weren't, they weren't as effective. Um, after a while, they were doing two monitors. I, I don't know if you've heard of this, the, the double sequential shocking where they would use two monitors, right? So they would hook up two pads on the top, two pads on the bottom, select the energy, and then one guy would try and hit the both buttons of discharge electricity at the same time. Have you heard of this? No, the craziest thing ever. I couldn't believe it was a real thing, but it was a real thing. And lo and behold, it wasn't working, of course. So they did it. The went, went away from that. So if any of the doctors in the in the ICU say, "Hey, let's do double double sequential shocking," just let them know. Hey, uh, just so you know, AHA says that doesn't work. It's not effective. And then they can do whatever they want, obviously. But at least you you let them know. The big thing now that AHA is harping on is crew resource management. That came from the airline industry to where uh, these pilots they weren't paying attention to their flight instrument panels. They were literally crashing into mountains. And the co-pilots and these and the navigators weren't saying anything because, oh, my God, the guy's the pilot. You know, what am I going to do questioning him? You know, and they would crash these airplanes right in the mountains. Well, they brought over that crew resource management to medicine to where if you see the person that's running the code and they're doing something wrong, point it out to them. Right. And, and if they say, oh, yeah, I know it's because this and this and this. All right. They have reasoning. But if you point something out and they go, oh, crap, that's totally right, right? Uh, we're going to save the patient. Remember, we're the, we're the advocates for the patient. So just keep that in mind. If you see something that, that the doc's not doing right that, that you think is wrong, just, hey, doc, real quick, I, I, I took ACLS and they said this and this and this. But remember, doctors can do whatever they want. Uh, ACLS guidelines is truly a guideline for them to where you and me, we have to abide by it, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, amniotor, like I said, uh, VFib, pulses, VTAC, stable VTAC, stable, stable, stable. Uh, contraindications again, second, third degree AV blocks. It can it can cause hypotension, so that's why it's one of the contraindications. The dose we have the state uh, live dose and the dead dose, cardiac arrest, three hundred, followed by one hundred and fifty every three to five minutes, and then our stable or live dose is one hundred and fifty over ten minutes. 
mm-hmm. uh, aspirin, atropine. The big change on that is one milligram to a max of three. Uh, does not you does not work on third degree AV blocks because there's a total disassociation between the atriums and the ventricles. The other type of person that uh, atropine does not work on is a heart transplant patient. And that's because when they do their heart transplant, they don't attach the vagus nerve. Atropine is a vagolytic drug that directly works on the vagus nerve, the 10th cranial nerve. So you can give them all the atropine you want. They have asymptomatic bradycardia. You're giving them atropine. Nothing's happening. You notice that the zipper on their chest, you start reading their chart. You're like, oh, crap, this guy was a heart transplant patient. Atropine won't work. Now, instead of medicine, you got to go to Edison medicine, right? You got to pace them. And we'll go over that in a minute. minute. So if you can remember, uh, third degree block and heart transplant patients are the two patients that atropine is contraindicated on. And uh, a lot of seasoned medics actually didn't know the one about the uh, heart transplant patients, which makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, Cardiosim, your dose, 25 milligrams IV, max of 20, and then repeat it every three to five minutes, uh, 0.35 milligrams per kilogram, blah, blah, blah. A whole lot of nothing. D10, don't worry about that. Epi, uh, we give it for everything. Lidocaine, the big one is just look on the bottom, your first dose, one to one and a half. And then your second dose, 0. 0.5 to 0. 0.75. Again, pretty much all these drugs are contraindicated in second and third degree blocks. Uh, so just have that in mind. And we'll go over blocks real quick. I know you know them, but we'll just touch on it again. It's nice to kind of go over some of this stuff because some people are like, oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, mag sulfate, uh, torsosporins, uh, reactive airway disease like asthma, you can use it in, and eclampsia, which you're not going to see any of these. Contraindications again, second, third degree AV blocks. Narcan, uh, it doesn't hurt to give it to them, especially you and ICU. Uh, if your patients are still with it, obviously they're there for a reason. So they might still ask for uh, pain management. I know there's a whole lot of uh, changes and protocols on how you can and can't give pain management. Did you hear about Pam Bondi? She's trying to pass some law that she forbids all doctors of prescribing pen, pain medicine after any surgical, uh, uh, after any surgery. No, I hear not. Yeah, man. My sister just told me she's a nurse in Los Angeles and she saw it on the news. I'm like, what? So imagine something like a total hip replacement or a total knee replacement. And all they're giving them is Motrin 800. Could you imagine that brother? Yeah. Right. <laughs> You've seen those knee surgeries, man. Those things are barbaric. Yeah, it's crazy. Oh, those things are horrible, man. I can't even imagine. Yeah, so there's she's trying to pass that law, man. Which is why is that? Because she doesn't want addiction. Yep, yep, <clears throat> yep. It's the craziest thing, man. Yeah. So who knows, man? But I mean, if you get, I mean, there's what do they say? Anything after ten days, you can develop dependency, but it's not a hundred percent proven. But I mean, dude, you got to give something to these post-op patients, man. That's yeah. just that's just not practicing good medicine. So anyway, I digress off the subject. Um, in the street, we use this quite a bit. There was a, a maybe about a year ago, right before COVID, man, we had a run, a run of uh, overdoses. They were lacing a lot of the heroin and a lot of the pills with fentanyl, man. And we we uh, we having to load like quite a bit of Narcan on these people. Um, uh, death from opioids is actually the leading cause of death for people under 65 right now, man, more than heart attacks, strokes, and cancers. It's crazy. So when they say it's an epidemic, you know, it it really is. It's crazy. Uh, Nitro, uh, get one spray sublingually, uh, you want to get their pain to zero. The scenario I give a lot of my students is you have a, a, a person complaining of non provoked chest pain, uh, left arm pain radiating down, left jaw pain, has a history of a heart attack, says that his pain now feels the same as his last, last heart attack. You give him uh, uh, his initial blood pressure is 160 over 90. You give him one squirt of nitro. Now it drops to 150 over 70. You give him a second squirt of nitro because his pain was still a, f- a five. He still has a, you know, 130 over 60. But now uh, after two squirts of nitro, he says his pain is a one and his blood pressure is still 120 over 60. The scenario I asked him is, what do you do? Because they're at a pain of one, their their, uh, blood pressure is still great. A lot of my students say, well, I'm good. They're They're at a pain scale of one. 
Well, if you can remember, we're uh, here to uh, alleviate patients of pain. So our goal is to get them to zero. So as long as their systolic blood pressure holds, give them that third spray of nitro, which now is, mm-hmm. is unlimited nitro because it's uh, as long as the systolic is above 90. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Sodium bicarb, if you're working somebody for a long time, just remember to give this, right? It doesn't necessarily bring them back. It just in, uh, uh, improves their metabolic state. Okay, that is it for that because we're going to go over some of this other stuff here. Okay. Brother, if you need to go up and, and go to the bathroom or get something to eat, please feel free to do so, man. I'm good, sir. Thank yeah, you. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know how it is, brother, having to, <laughs> having to sit behind this stuff, man. Mm-hmm. All right. Okay. So you see a blue screen in front of you, right? PowerPoint type stuff. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Let's go over some of this stuff here. Nothing here. This just says that it was all scientifically based. Uh, all the things that AHA wants you to, to go over, right? Uh, a systematic approach. The big thing they're harping on is CPR, CPR, CPR. I'll show you a video at the end, man, uh, that brings home the importance of just pump on their chest. That's the biggest, biggest thing. Um, airway management, rhythm recognition. There's 14 different rhythms that AHA wants you to recognize and if needed, mitigate, right? If they need treatment, then treat them. If not, remember, we treat the patient, not the monitor. Um, IV over IO, medications, we went over that. So when we ask uh, scenario questions now, you'll know it. Cardioversion. Um, when we cardiovert someone, the biggest thing we have to remember is hit the sync button. We start our energy selection at 50 joules. Our second one is 100. Our third is 150. And then our last is 200. So 50, 100, 150, 200, 200, 200, 200, all the way to the cows come home. Then the biggest thing is remember to hit the sync button when cardioverting because we don't want an RNT phenomenon. Um, before we give any kind of Edison medicine, before we do cardioversion and pacing, remember we have to sedate our patients as a brand new medic, man. When I was working in Los Angeles, uh, this is when we still had the life pack fives. I don't know if you've ever seen them, that they had the paddles. Um, I forgot to, I forgot two things. I forgot to put the gel on the paddles and I forgot to medicate my patient. So when I shocked them, uh, they were cardioverted. I did my energy selection. I shocked them. Ah! they screamed in pain right and then i took off the paddles and they had two nice big burn marks on their chest and it smelled like burnt flesh not a good thing um with the pads now we don't have to put the gel on but we still got to medicate them so whatever your protocol is for conscious sedation uh prior to uh any uh procedures make sure you you sedate them first right uh we use ketamine in the field are you guys using that in the hospital ketamine at all i don't use ketamine Okay. All right. Uh, it's good because it, it, it acts fast. Even if it's given IM within 10 minutes, it, it takes an effect. Um, and it causes that retrograde, uh, retrograde amnesia to where if you do hurt them, they're not going to remember it. Uh, we also use uh, Versed. I'm sure that's probably what you guys use. Uh, we just went to uh, uh, Rockeronium also. And then pacing, put the pads on, give them medication, right, to, to gork them out. We start at five milliamps and we start our rate at a rate of 75, 70, somewhere in the mid 70s. So a rate in the mid 70s and our electricity at five milliamps. We increase our milliamps by five to 10 milliamps until we get two things. Electrical capture on the monitor. So you see the pacer spike followed by a QRS complex. And then we have to get mechanical capture. So we have to feel a pulse at the radial pulse or carotid as long as we're feeling a pulse somewhere. So we get mechanical and electrical capture. That's when we stop increasing electricity. They used to say, once you get mechanical and electrical capture, cut down your electricity by five to 10. I did that for like on, on a real patient and I lost capture and then I had to go a lot higher to regain it. So once you get capture, don't mess with that electricity. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, team dynamics pacing. Yeah. Uh, of course, it just, this just says that this course is designed to improve your skills. 
nothing there. Uh, recognize and mitigate respiratory and cardiac arrest. That's it. History. I teach this to a lot of uh, firefighters and paramedics, and they get geeked out on the history of stuff. Um, this one down at the bottom, Paul Zoll, like the Zoll monitors. He's the guy that invented or came up with closed chest defibrillation. Back in the day, it used to be two wires wrapped around wooden paddles, and they would uh, put the wires directly open chest on the heart. And then he figured out, hey, let's do it this way, and and that's it. Uh, more history, boring. Uh, what they want you to harp on now is high chest compression fraction. They figured out that the, um, the least uh, breaks you take in doing compressions, the better outcome for the patient that they're going to have. We know it takes forever to build up that inner thoracic pressure when you're doing compressions. And the very first compression you stop, that inner thoracic pressure just drops down straight. So what they're doing now, one of the other changes in ACLS is, um, you know, when the monitor comes time to shock, right? Uh, shock advised, you select your energy and then no one touches the patient for quite a while. What they're doing now is you do compressions all the way up into where it's time to deliver the shock. And then you just lift your hands up above the patient's chest. And the second that energy is delivered, you go right back to doing compressions because they want to maintain that. They call it high co uh, chest compression fraction. Mm -hmm. They did a study and they, uh, they come up with the idea or the notion <clears throat> that just a 10% increase in better compressions equated to 11% better outcome in, in patients uh, surviving cardiac arrest, which is, which is cool. You know, all they did was just improve CPR. The rate, if you remember, it used to be at least 100. Now the rate is between 100 to 120. You, you've heard the song, Another One Bites the Dust by Queen. Mm -hmm. da -dum, dum, dum. That beat right there is at least 100 to 120 beats per minute to where it used to be staying alive. Staying alive will take you at 100, but they want us to go above 100 and allow for good recoil, which if you've done any kind of CPR, and I'm sure you, ha you have, it's hard to get those fast compressions and let the chest all the way up, man. It, it really is a, a difficult thing, man. Uh, so 100 to 120 beats per minute. Uh, that's your rate, 30 to 2. Remember, uh, for infants, children, and adults, one rescuer CPR is 30 to 2. Two rescuer CPR for infants and children is 15 to two. Mm -hmm. Done and done. All right. Uh, so the hands hover method, way to improve CCF. Hands hover, continuing compressions when the monitor says, you know, analyzing rhythm. Once the monitor says analyzing, analyzing rhythm, shock advised, go right back to doing compressions. Don't wait for anything to, to tell you differently. And then switching compressors every two minutes, you know, man, doing CPR is tiring, bro, especially like on these big patients. And you really got to like almost do jumping jacks on their chest to get that, that, that adequate tidal uh, uh, cardiac output. It's tiring. So even if you feel great, you got an adrenaline and dump, you're, you know, you had a good night's rest, you feel charged and ready to go every two minutes switch compressors because now your next two minutes coming up now you get fatigued and now your form starts to go so every two minutes change compressors and then if you work in a field uh there's a lot of metronomes you could uh download and use the app because a lot of people have a difficulty in figuring out uh how fast 120 beats per minute is uh, so i downloaded one you know when uh, uh it does one or two things can you hear that? Yeah. Right there. That's at a rate of 120 beats per minute. So if I, it does one of two things, it lets me know how fast to go. And then the other thing, it just lets me forget that I'm pumping on some dead person's chest and just lets me concentrate on that little ticking, right? And that's a twofold. So nice and easy. Those are the, uh, some of the other changes that came up in the 2021 guidelines. <sighs> Uh, anatomy of the heart. Remember, the heart has uh, specialized cardiac tissue that only cardiac has. I highlighted two of them because two of the medications work directly on that type of cardiac tissue, automoticity and excitability. Automaticity is the ability for the heart muscle to spontaneously contract. So if I were to take the heart, your heart out of your chest, put it on a Petri dish, it would continue to beat until it was anoxic, right? Until it ran out of oxygen itself. But it has that tissue or that specialization tissue. Uh, 
And then excitability means that it has the ability to respond to electrical impulse. Oh, if it wasn't beating anymore, I, sh I zap it, boom, and it contracts, right? Cardiac tissue is the only one, the only tissue that has those five specialized functions. Amniorone, it's known as an antidithrhythmic, but it also works on the sodium, calcium, and channel blockers or channels uh, of the heart to let um, uh, uh, your sodium and potassium pump work more effectively. Do you remember that from school, the sodium potassium pump? Mm -hmm. We'll go over that again. So what amniotor does is it, low, it lowers the defibrillation threshold, so it makes defibrillation more effective at lower settings. That's why the biphasic Zoll monitors, um, if you've ever messed with them, you'll hit your energy selection to 200, but the Zoll monitors will measure chest impedance. And when it goes to deliver the shock, it's like, no, you don't need 200. Let, let's do 180. And it, it's very effective at uh, selecting energy to where the life packs, they're old monitors, man, old technology. They still work, whatever. Uh, but you select 200 joules and you'll get 200 joules. Uh, so that's why we use amniodorm because it makes it uh, defibrillation more effective on that heart tissue. And then lidocaine directly affects the automaticity of the heart. Uh, so it increases the V-fib threshold. It makes the, the ventricles less likely to fibrillate. So with those two medications and shocking, uh, it's a win-win scenario. Anatomy of the heart, the, the outside, the middle, and the uh, uh and the, uh, the outside, the middle, and the inside, right? Mm -hmm. uh, two atriums, two ventricles. One side receives deoxygenated. The other side receives oxygenated. You know that uh -huh. picture of the heart. Yeah. Nice and pretty. Next one. Um, we look at uh, the cardiac tissue. Then we have gap junctions. Gap junctions are there just those specialized tissues that elect let electricity travel from one cell to another. And inside cardiac tissue, we have actin and myosin right down there. If we look at it even smaller, those actin and myosin bands right next to it, we have cells, right, cardiac cells. And within those cells, we have the mitochondria and they produce ATP, adenosine triphosphate, right? Yep. We, we need adenosine triphosphate to make the, the uh, actin and myosin work. Otherwise, the muscles wouldn't contract, wouldn't relax. There's a whole thing I get into here. You don't need to hear it. You know it. Sodium mm -hmm. potassium pump. We need ATP to bind onto these gaps to make it open. Remember, uh, potassium has a higher affinity inside the cell. Sodium has a higher affinity outside the cell. But we need to bring potassium inside the cell to make it work more properly. Uh, marathon runners, triathletes, all those people, they, they take excess potassium. And the theory behind that is... It'll make the muscles repolarize faster if you have more potassium extracellularly. Um, just say it right here on the first slide, you need ATP. It binds onto the bridge, becomes adenosine diphosphate, bridge opens the other way, blah, blah, blah. Real quick and simple. All right. When we get to the pacemakers of the heart, each pacemaker has its own set rhythm or rate. And then as that no, as that uh, pacer goes out because it's damaged, it's hypoxic, something happens, the next pacer down the heart takes over. So here's some numbers that we have to know, right? The SA node, the regular rate is 60 to 100. That's our normal heart mm -hmm. rate. If that one goes down, then we have the AV, uh, uh, AV node, and that rate is 40 to 60. Mm -hmm. The bundle of his, it's just a gap. It's just a bridge. Don't think of it as a pacer because it's not uh same thing with the left bundle branch block but then we get into Purkinje fibers right 20 to 40 so the numbers we have to know is 40 to 60 uh sorry uh 60 to 100 yep 40 to 60 and 20 to 40 we have to know those numbers because when it comes time to identify rhythms we got to know what we're looking at arrhythmogenic zones this just tells you which part of the heart are most likely to cause arrhythmias and it's just those four parts right there. Measuring uh, or using paper to measure uh, our ECGs. If you remember, up and down measures electricity or amplitude. Left and right measures time. One large box equals 0.5 millivolts up and down. And uh, one small box equals 0.1 millivolts uh, or 0 0.04 seconds. We'll go over this. Triplets method, uh, which method did you use or do you use to count your, your rate? Do you use the triplets or do you use a six second? 
Uh, six seconds. Six, it's the easiest, man. Yeah, I try to explain yeah. this one to people, and they're like, huh? So I won't even go over that because you use this one. Yeah, remember, we could only use a six second strip if it's a regular rhythm. And we know that it's a six second strip because from hashtag to hashtag is three seconds. And then this one mm -hmm. to this one is another three seconds. We count right. how many QRS complexes multiply by 10 and we get the ring. Good. Uh -huh. All right. So our six steps to rhythm recognition. And I try to, to let my students know, always, always, always use this method because otherwise you'll, you'll go off on another direction and you'll forget what you're looking at. And a lot of medics that I work with now, seasoned medics, They'll start to look at a rhythm. They'll start off P waves. Okay. Then they'll go to some other weird step and forget where they're at. And they can't figure out what rhythm they're looking at. So if you always uh, look at your P waves, make sure that they're upright, normal in appearance. You got a QRS complex that's within the time limits, right? We have to know these time limits, 0 0.04 yeah. to 0 0.12 seconds. What's the conduction ratio? One P wave for every QRS, one QRS for every P wave what our PRI is, it can't be longer than 0 0.20 because then we get into different types of blocks, right? 0.12 to 0 0.20 seconds. Mm -hmm. What the rate is, depending on which pacemaker is, is taking over, will give us a rate. And if the rhythm is regular, right? We have an irregular, irregular, irregularly rhythm. We have a fib, right? Which the majority of these old people down here are in. Uh, when we get into 12 leads, we'll get us to uh, ST segment elevation and T waves. Our first rhythm, right? P waves, QRS, it's within normal time. Conduction, one P for every QRS, vice versa. The PRI is within that normal range. And it's at a rate of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it's a rate of 70. It's regular. This is just a normal sinus rhythm. Nothing crazy, nothing out of the ordinary. When we get into slow rhythms, we know it's slower. It's a rate of 30. P waves, upright, present, QRSs look a little wide, but we know this is still an atrial rhythm because we have a P wave before the QRS. Conduction okay. ratio is still one to one. Uh, and it's regular, just a normal sinus bradycardia. Uh, sinus tac, we see those P waves there. Everything looking good. Conduction ratio, uh, QRSs, PRI, everything where it needs to be. It's just fast, right? So sinus, sinus tac. We get a patient that comes in, right? He says, uh, I'm just having some palpitations. I just, uh, I don't feel good, right? Um, we put them on the monitor. You see this fast rhythm, uh, blood pressure is great. What would be our treatment of choice for this guy? He's tacky. Yeah, uh -huh. right. he's, he's stable and he's tacky. What would be the, the uh, treatment of choice for this guy? What medication? What do you mean, med medications? Yes, yes. What medication would you like to give this guy? It's an atrial rhythm, fast, and he's stable. Starts with an A. Pro oh, amiodarone? Adenosine. Adenosine. Yeah, yeah. Remember, uh, uh, amiodarone is given for ventricular rhythms that are fast. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh-huh, perfect. You got it. Same thing. This guy comes in and says, I don't feel good. I have palpitations. What's your name? Joe. What day of the week is it? It's Friday. So this is a stable patient with a fast rhythm. What medication would you like to give this guy? Cardizem. You can't you can give cardizem uh, yeah. if you're not sure if those QRS complexes are wide or short. But it's let's yeah. just say it's a shortened QRS complex, right? At a rate of 150. He says he doesn't feel good. It's a stable patient. We're going to opt to give this guy adenosine. Okay. Remember, because it originally originated in the atrial, right? Uh, yeah. Well, ventricular above the ventricle, so it's originated in the atrial. This is a state. I don't give a lot of adenosine. Yeah, yeah. It it's rare, man. It's rare. Yeah. If you have to. Yeah, just keep it in the toolbox. Now. Okay. You see this same patient, fast rhythm, pale, cool, diaphoretic, says he's short of breath and has chest pain. This is an unstable patient now, right? Right. Now, what what is, what would be your treatment of choice on this guy? We can't Doxy. give it. Yes, shock them, right? Shock them. Synchronized cardio version. Remember to hit that R, that sync button and, yeah. and shock him. Good. Yeah, stable or unstable. Remember, unstable Edison medicine, stable regular medicine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, a fit or a flutter. We know it's a flutter because of those characteristic F waves, right? They look like the teeth on a saw. This mm -hmm. would be an A flutter. Uh, you count how many P waves before every QRS. So one, two, three, four. So this would be an atrial flutter with a four to one conduction ratio. You just look at the patient, 
find out what's going on, support the uh, uh, vital signs, and that's it. You, if it's a new onset A flutter, you can give Cardiazem, but let's find out what's going with the patient first, right? Maybe right. some oxygen and some fluids might cure this. We don't know. We know this one, right? A fib, uh, weird, chaotic. Uh, no P wave. Uh huh. No P waves absent, and the QRSs are doing whatever they want. That's a classic a uh, a flutter. Or sorry, yeah, a fib. Uh, okay. If it's a new onset a fib, we can give cardiazem. If it's been going on for a while, supre- uh, just support the vital signs. That's it. Now we get to our first rhythm that's below the atriums. And I know it's below the atriums because the P waves are inverted, right? They're upside down, which tells me that this comes from the AV node. So that's at a rate of one, two, three, four. Do you remember the rate of the AV node? Uh, b- 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 40, 40 to 60. 60. Yes, you got it, brother. You got it. Yeah. Rate of 40 to 60. So one, two, three, four. Um, what would we call this rhythm? You know, it's junctional because the P waves are inverted or if they were absent with an, with a short QRS, you know, that'd be, it'd be a junctional rhythm. What would we call this rhythm? It's a ventricular rhythm, right? No, no, no. It's junctional. Remember the QRSs are short. They're yeah. Uh-huh. So it's, it's, it's above the ventricles. It's in the AV node. We have it's a uh here's the SA node, here's the AV node, and then we have the Purkinje fibers, yeah. the ventricle. So it's above the ventricles. The key on this is remember to look at these QRSs that they're nice and short. So we know that it's still happening above the ventricles. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we would call this rhythm one of two things: an idiojunctional, which idi- okay. idiode you just know that means within the same. Or they also call it an accelerated junctional. I don't know why they call it an accelerated, but it means the same one and the same thing. Okay. Yeah. If you just stick with idiojunctional rhythm, you'll be fine. Uh, okay. Now let's just say we have this, this same rhythm, uh, but now we were, okay. Now uh, imagine these complexes don't exist, right? So now it would be at a rate of 20. Same thing. What would we call this rhythm? So you're getting 20 beats a minute? Uh Uh-huh. It's exactly what you see here. But now instead of four QRS complexes, I just have two. So it'd be at a rate of 20. Exactly what you see here. Inverted P wave. What would we call this rhythm? It's slow, Uh, right? It's a slow rhythm. Yeah. Yeah. I have no idea. Okay, nah, not a problem, brother. Yeah, it'd be a junctional bradycardia. Okay. Makes sense, right? Sure. Yeah, a lot of people overthink it, but it's it's really, a lot of people start to say idioventricular or, vi- no, 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 it's junctional. Right. Yeah, it's junctional. Uh, so now let's imagine, same rhythm, now let's imagine there's a beat here, a beat here, and a beat here, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seventy. Our regular rate for a, 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 a AV node is forty to sixty, right? So mm-hmm. this is seventy. This is at a rate of seventy. Now it's faster. What would we call this rhythm? Idiotaki. No, close. You have the right idea. You're at the right idea with the tacky. It's going to blow your mind here. A junctional tachycardia. Okay. Makes sense now, right? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of people just, uh, they're like, I don't know. I'm not sure, but you know it, man. I know you know it. Yeah, it's just, it's weird. It's weird. I don't know why they make it so complicated. Mm-hmm. First degree blocks, real simple. Me and you probably are walking around with the first degree, v, uh, first degree AV block, not even know it. It's not a big deal. The only reason why it makes it a first degree AV block is because um, the PRI from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the R wave is longer than this 0.20. That's Mm -hmm. the only thing. So we would call this a sinus rhythm with a first degree block. Nothing big, right? Uh, A lot of people probably walk around with this. Not a big deal. If the patient says he doesn't feel good, get their vital signs and just treat the vital signs, right? Not a big deal. Uh, Okay, now we get into our other blocks, our first degree type one, our um, uh, second degree type one, right? You wink at me, I winky bock. 
Mm-hmm. When we get into our first degree uh, type two, we always look at that PRI interval, right? So right here, it looks pretty normal. On this one, it's getting longer. And on this one, it's even way longer. On this one, we have a P wave and then a missing QRS complex. Now, this complex here looks the same as this one, right? Mm -hmm. This one here looks the same as the second one and second one. So we notice that the PRI is going, 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 and then gone, right? Mm -hmm. Going, going, gone is a first, a second degree type one, second degree type one. Always remember that you have a very, a varying uh, PRI until you get a P wave with a non-conducted QRS going, going, gone. And there's some, some scenarios uh, afterwards that we'll get to that. You have to remember this. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So going, going, gone, second degree type one. Uh, Okay. Second degree type two. The difference from a type one to a type two second degree is that this PRI stays the same, right? That PRI right there is the same as this one is the same as this one. But then I get a P wave with a non-conducted QRS and then it starts over again and the PRI stays constant. So the difference between a type one and a type two second degree block, a type two second degree block will have the same PRI, but then drop a QRS. Second degree type two has a constant PRI and then just arbitrarily just drop a QRS complex and then the rhythm starts over. So you have the same PRI, all of a sudden you have a P wave with the non-conducted QRS you have a short compensatory pause and then the rhythm starts over again. That's it. Uh, third degree blocks. The, if you, if I follow the P waves, they march out. And if I follow the QRS is they march out, but they don't march out to each other. Think of it as two drummers playing different songs, uh, playing different beats in the same song. On this type of, uh, of a rhythm, we can't use atropine because there's a total disassociation between the atriums and the ventricles. So on this rhythm here, we're going to go directly to uh, 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 pacing, right? Because it's a slow rhythm. One, two, three, four. It's at a rate of 40. I'm sure this patient isn't, isn't hemodynamically stable. Medicine won't work with this guy. So now we got to go to Edison medicine, right? And uh, pacing is, is our preferred method for treating this guy. <clears throat> Blocks. The video just explains what I just talked about. Uh, PVCs, right? I know it's a premature ventricular contraction because this complex here right there is very wide as opposed to the other ones. Um, and that's how I know it's a PVC. Unifocal, just one port, one spot in the ventricles that it's coming from. <laughs> Multifocal or uh, polymorphic is what AHA calls it. And I see that this complex looks different from this complex, right? That just means that it's uh, these beats are coming from two different spots in the ventricles. Multi-ectopic, multifocal, or polymorphic. It all means the same thing. It just means that it's coming from different, different spots in the ventricles. So this would be a, always identify the underlying rhythm. So this would be a normal sinus rhythm with multifocal PVCs. The treatment of choice on this, believe it or not, is high flow oxygen. I've had patients with uh, throwing every other beat, uh, uh, a PVC, I would put them on high flow oxygen with a non rebreather and it would knock it right out. It'd be the weirdest thing, man, right? Because that's what they taught us in medic school. Uh, put oxygen on everything first and then let's see what happens. So, oxygen, oxygen, oxygen. Now, uh, do. Okay, moving right along to the next beat here. Unifocal, okay. So by Gemini, it just means that every second beat 
Every bi beat is a ventricular beat. So mm -hmm. just be normal sinus rhythm uh, with ventricular bigeminy. Again, treatment of choice on this would be oxygen. Mm -hmm. If the patient says, I just don't feel good, right? Such uh, like in this one here, every, every second beat is a ventricular beat, ventricular mm -hmm. trigeminy, and then you would get ventricular quadrigeminy and then eventually runs a VTAC, which is not good. And then mm -hmm. because the... The, the corresponding pulse after that would be V fib. That's not good. So we want to knock this out ahead of the game. So oxygen first. Now we have a stable patient with ventricular rhythms. This is a, a great candidate for amniodarone, right? Because this is a stable pulse producing patient. And what is our live dose for amnio? Uh, uh, <clears throat> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 150 yes my man perfect good live dose 150 as a bolus or sorry as a uh, uh as an infusion right Our yeah live dose. a slow perfect. yeah slow drip yeah 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 my man you got it okay so amnio just a, uh, an infusion over 10 minutes that's our live dose now we have this here because we didn't get to him in time. The first thing I want to find out is if this patient has a pulse or not, because yep. that, that'll dictate how I'm going to treat him. Right. So this guy has a pulse. What is my first dose of amnio? Oh, uh, well, 150. Yes. Now patient goes unconscious. We start to work them. What would my first dose of amnio be? Because he's dead now. What would my dead dose of amnio be? 300. Pushed. Perfect. You got it, brother. Yeah. You got it. Perfect. Now, if this patient was unstable, pale, cool, diaphoretic, chest pain, shortness of breath, right? But he had a pulse. Um, we would want to give him Edison medicine, right? Because it'd be an unstable patient uh, producing a pulse. We want to give him Edison medicine. We want to uh, cardiovert this guy, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Remember to hit the R button to sync those R waves. Mm -hmm. Hey, Sisterly, Hollywood loves to shock this thing, man. I don't know why. It's like me shocking a mannequin. It's not going to come back to life, but it's, it's yeah. more, more dramatic. So whatever, bro. Yeah, we don't shock a Sisterly. <laughs> right. uh, the, only thing, the only thing we do for this is epi every three to five minutes and continue compressions until someone says stop, right? Right. Yeah, we're usually not. I've never, ever in my 28 years of doing this brought back an asystole. It just doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. V-fib, we know this, right? Uh, first thing we do is CPR. Second thing we do is we give uh, meds. What is my first medicine of choice in AFib? Or sorry, V-fib. Starts with an E. Epi. Epi, yes, my man. One milligram every three to five minutes. I circulate it for two minutes. Then it comes time to shock. I shock them. Now, my next medication after epi, dead dose, would be? Of the uh, 300 of amy. My man, yes. You let it circulate. Two minutes, shock. My next drug of choice would be epi, yes. Let it mm -hmm. circulate two minutes, shock. My next dead dose of amnio would be? Another 300. Oh, no, your second is 150. Oh, man, Tam, you're good, brother. You're good. I don't even finish this class, dude. You're golden already, bro. I wish. I wish. <laughs> you're golden. Good. So now we've given our two, dose of, two doses of amnio. We've given epi. Now, uh, what drug can we use? It starts with an L. Lidocaine. Yes, my man. And do you have the dose on there? Our first dose of lidocaine would be? Yeah, I got it. First, there's lidocaine. Um, a gram to uh, um, a one milligram to one, one and a half milligrams. Yes, my boy, you got it, man. You're golden, brother. You're golden. Perfect. And then our second dose, we know that. And then eventually use sodium bicarb and whatever, whatever. Right. You got this, dude. You just did your mega code. Congratulations. Good. Now we have this beautiful rhythm here. We got P waves upright, normal in appearance. QRS complexes, one-to-one -one conduction ratio. Everything is regular, but we reach down for a pulse and there's no pulse. What do we call this? I'm sorry, I wasn't paying attention. That's okay, my brother. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. we have this beautiful rhythm here. We have P waves yeah. upright, normal. We have one-to-one -one conduction ratio. Yeah, it's regular, but we reach down and there's no pulse. What do we call this? There's no pulse. There's being no. Produced. No pulse being, uh, being produced with this rhythm. Look at the top here. Pulseless electrical activity, PEA. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Remember, when you have that nice 
rhythm on the monitor, but they have no pulse. It's a pulseless electrical, right? That just means that the heart is, the electricity is flowing through the heart, but it's not uh, contracting hard enough to produce a pulse. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, 12 lead interpretation. I'm sure you don't see a whole lot of 12 leads, man. Uh, this just tells you what lead is looking at what portion of the heart. Yeah. I'm, a dumb, I'm a dumb fireman, brother. I can't put these numbers with letters together. So I have this chart here. It kind of helps. Um, usually, not always, but usually every MI that I've seen is usually inferior. Don't know why, but the majority of my MIs are inferior. But now I'm a dumb fireman, so I need pictures, man. So now those that first slide I showed you puts those numbers to the corresponding picture to where I could put it together now and go, oh, that's what I'm looking at, right? Uh, lead one, two, uh, or two, three, and AVF looks at the inferior portion of the wall. Uh, V1 through four looks at the anterior and the septal part. V1, AVL, five and six looks at the uh, lateral wall. So that gives me a good uh, a good impression of what's going on with that patient or with the MI. Normal elevation or normal ST segment, we look at the isoelectric line and see that after the QRS complex, it goes back to the normal isoelectric line and then the T wave. If we have ST elevation, we look at the isoelectric line and see that after the QRS, now that isoelectric line is way up here and it starts to meet with that T wave. That's what we call an ST elevation and it's characteristic of a heart attack, right? A STEMI, uh, ST elevation, myocardial infarction. That's what it stands for. Mm -hmm. When we're looking at 12 leads and we have to look at our AVL lead for reciprocal changes, I look and see... Uh, on a strain pattern, I have that isoelectric line there, the QRS complex, and then the isoelectric line just barely drops below to where it originally was, just goes a little lower, and then we have the T wave. That's not a big deal. That's nothing out of the ordinary. We just call that a strain pattern. That's a normal T wave inversion. Now, if the patient is having an MI, <clears throat> I look at the isoelectric line, I look at my QRS complex, and then after the QRS complex, you see how that isoelectric line drops way below? Mm -hmm. That would be a true reciprocal change or a T, uh, uh, ST segment depression. That's how we know the patient would be having an MI. Uh, all the information that we look at on the 12 lead, this is from a life pack. So if you print out your code summary, this is what you would see. It tells you the heart rate, what time, uh, it tells you the measurements. How long is a QRS complex? What is the PRI interval, the QT to QTC intervals, and then our QRS to T axis deviation, right? <clears throat> I don't need to worry so much about uh, my P axis. So we don't worry about these numbers here. I look at these numbers here, the QRS and T axis. Now, if I take 30 and subtract it from 130, we have 100. Would you agree? Yes. So that would leave our access deviation at 100. So if it's 100 or above, it's probably not an MI. But if it's under 100, it probably is. So access deviation 100 or higher, it's probably not an MI. An access deviation under 100 it probably is but we got to look at other stuff right we got to look at other stuff mm -hmm. and i'll show you here in a second uh okay in order for it to be classified as an st uh or uh, um, a STEMI, right you got to show elevation in, in uh, one millimeter or greater two contiguous leads that means two leads that are touching and it has to be a nice clean tracing you can't have a bunch of squiggly lines to where you can't make out what you're looking at <clears throat> so we look at our first 12 lead here lead one everything looks cool there that isoelectric line is a little messed up but no st elevation in two three avf looks good there's no straining or t wave uh, inversion v1 everything looks good right nothing out of the ordinary on this this would just be a normal sinus rhythm on a 12 lead not a big deal we look at this one here uh, okay, lead one, lead two, I see that here's my isoelectric line. And then after the QRS, it goes way high. 
right? That would be an ST elevation. Mm -hmm. Same thing with lead three. I look, here's my isoelectric line, QRS. Now look at that way up here. Definitely uh, ST elevation. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. I look at my AVL right here, and here's my isoelectric line, QRS. It drops below. That is a reciprocal change. Nothing going on on any of this other stuff here. Um, if you've if you've printed out one of these before where the patient is having an MI, there should be a uh, a message. Let me get this out of the way. There should be a sign right here that says acute MI suspected, right? Mm -hmm. But it doesn't have it here. Um, so the reason for that is you look at, uh, so we look at one other thing. Sorry, one other thing. If I look at... Okay, if I look at, remember my axis deviation, that at my QRS and T axis, if I take, uh, if I minus, uh, if I take away four from 88, is that over or under 100? It's under. Way under 100, right? So remember mm -hmm. the rule, if it's under 100, it's probably an MI. If it's 100 or over, it probably isn't. So I have an uh, uh, ST elevation in V2, 3, and AVL, axis deviation under 100, but there's no acute MI suspected message here. <laughs> the reason for that is this is a life pack. That elevation is under a millimeter, believe it or not. So because it's under a millimeter, the computer isn't picking it up as being an MI. But now that you know that, we have elevation two, three AVF and an axis deviation under a hundred that this patient is having an MI, right? Yep. Uh, you might question them and ask them how they're feeling. They're like, man, I just don't feel good. I have some pain in my left jaw. Uh, it just started all of a sudden, right? Do a 12 lead, take their pressure. You could prophylactically give them aspirin and nitro, right? And then obviously you would do a 12 lead and you would see that axis deviation. If a cardiologist was in the room and you spatted that axis deviation to him off, he'd want to hire you in his office, right? You go, now you go, now you go work for a, a rich uh, cardiologist and everything would be great. <laughs> Good. All right. So I'm going to look at this one. It, <clears throat> and one of the first, when I was uh, telling you about the access deviation or the, the acute MI suspected message, here it is, right? It says acute MI suspected. Now, 30 minus uh, or 130 minus 30, would that put me at or or over 100? Yeah, I put you at 100. At 100. So remember, 100 or over, it probably isn't. Mm -hmm. Under 100, it probably is. So we have an axis deviation at 100. I look at my tracings here. That that's a regular strain pattern because that isoelectric line is constant. No elevation, nothing there, nothing there, right? I don't see any elevation. That's a, a strain pattern because if you look at that isoelectric line, there's three instances where the life pack, sometimes even the Zoll, will give you a false positive and saying it's an MI. One of the ones is if there's left ventricular hypertrophy, and how we can tell if the patient has left ventricular hypertrophy is if these QRS complexes are super long. Do you remember that from nursing yeah. school? If mm -hmm. these QRS complexes are touching each other, they're really long and spiked. That means that the patient has left ventricular hypertrophy, but this patient doesn't, right? Those QRS complexes are nice and uh, where they're supposed to be. There's no crazy elevation or nothing like that. The other way that this machine would give us a false positive if, if there was a bundle branch block. And if you remember bundle branch blocks like rabbit ears, there's nothing in this entire 12 lead that would look like a bundle branch block. Mm -hmm. And the third instance in which the machine would tell you uh, that the patient was having an acute MI when they weren't is if they were paced. And if I look at lead three right there, right there and right there, I see these pacer spikes right there, right? They're very faint, but nevertheless, there they are. Obviously, this is a demand pacemaker. Maybe it's not working the way it's supposed to because I have those pacer spikes, then a QRS, 
and then I get a P wave QRS. So now the heart starts back up again. So because this patient was asymptomatic, but he had a pacer, I know that his access deviation is at 100. The machine says they're having an acute MI, but they're not because they have a pacer, a pacer going on. So just remember that. Put that in your toolbox. If you remember it, cool. If not, don't worry about it. Not a big deal. Now, <clears throat> I look at this one here. Um, there's absence of a, uh, acute MI message suspected, right? There's no message up top. Um, I don't really see an elevation really nowhere, right? No reciprocal changes. Maybe, maybe something there. I don't know. Definitely not there. Everything's good. But now I look at my QR and T access deviation, right? QRS and T access deviation. 68 minus five under or over a hundred. Yeah, it's under. It's way under, right? Way yeah. under. You'd be 63, uh -huh. right? Uh, 63 degrees, way under 100. So this guy's a diabetic, and we know because uh, uh, diabetics interpret pain much differently than we do because of uh, extracellular floating sugar. It uh, causes neuropathy to the nerves. It makes the nerves deaden, and they don't perceive pain like we do. Mm -hmm. So this guy was a diabetic complaining of left elbow pain. That's it. Non-provoked left elbow pain. History of, uh, uh, of an MI in the past, but he says the pain now does absolutely not feel like the one before. All he has is left elbow pain, which, by the way, if you have a diabetic that has pain anywhere above the waist to the neck, put him on the monitor just to see what you can find because they perceive pain differently than we do. So this guy, we see that his access deviation is way under 100 degrees. Absence of acute MI suspected. I don't see any real elevation or depression anywhere. But we took this guy to the emergency room. They hauled him ass. They hauled his ass up to the cath lab, and he actually had a 99.9% uh, 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 blockage in the right coronary artery. Uh, it was in V1 through V3. Which, if you look at V1, I don't see shit. V2, maybe, maybe there. Definitely not there. But this brings home the point of you got to do a 12 lead every five minutes because it can drastically change every five minutes. So we gave this guy uh, 15 liters, right? Give him some nitro, give him, uh, put him on high flow O2. And he felt a little bit better after the nitro. But like I said, they took him up to the cath lab and he had almost 100% blockage. So that's why the reason I put this in there is because diabetics perceive pain differently. So we have to treat them differently. That's it. Questions on anything so far? No, sir. God, you're good, man. Uh, drug, we already went over them. Amniodarone, dead dose, live dose, atropine. Remember, our minimum dose is one milligram to a max of three. Give it fast. Dopamine, epi, we give it for all kinds of stuff now. Max sulfate, procainamide, sodium bicarb, uh, 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 acute coronary syndrome uh stable uh, remember uh stable versus unstable patients our stable patients get medicine our unstable patients get edison medicine so we either have to cardiovert them or pace them if it's a slow rhythm we pace them if it's a fast rhythm we cardiovert them if you can remember those two things you'll never go wrong if it's fast cardiovert if it's slow pace them You'll be golden with those two things. And obviously, uh, before any procedures, make sure you sedate them, right? Procedural sedation. Uh -huh. Don't take out. Make sure you hit the sync button. Cardiac arrest. We went over that. I made this insanely complicated slide here that just confuses you more than anything. Uh, and then if you get a patient back, um, remember, start active cooling measures. You want to get them between uh, 32 to 34 degrees Celsius. So put ice in uh, uh, their groin and their armpits. All right, let me see if I can make this work. What's this rhythm here? P is upright present. QRS normal. Minus. You got it. Oh, man. I don't even know why I even bother, man. You're so good. Okay. Yeah, right. <laughs>
All right, this one here. POA is upright present, QRS normal, right? Regular rate at a rate of 30. So the, oh, you, what is it? Yes. So it's, uh, it's. Um, just slow. Yeah, it's Brady, but it's yes. not. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. You oh, got it. Yeah. Brady. yeah, sinus Brady. Now, if these P waves were upside down or absent, now what would we call this? AFib? No, no, no. Uh, the, uh, everything would be normal the way it is. Yeah. It's a regular rate at a rate of 30, but now we have absent P waves. What would we call this rhythm? It's still up in the atrias. It's a it's below the SA node. What's the next uh, pacer that takes over? Uh, SV. A AV node. The AV. Oh, node. AV, AV. Yeah. So, what would we call this rhythm? Um. Starts with a J. Junctional. Junctional. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Junctional rhythm. That's it, man. That's the only reason I know, you know, it. a lot of people think now it can't be that simple. Yeah. It's that simple. Right. Okay. I promise. Yep. I, I promise. Yeah. Okay. So this rhythm here, obviously I don't even need to play it. Right. Uh, it's yeah. fast. Yeah. What would you call it? It's under 150 beats per minute. What would you call it? It's tachycardia. Yep. Sinus tack. Right. Now this beat at a rate of 193. What would we call this? V tech. No, uh, uh, small ventricles, right? Short ventricles. Okay. So it'd be up in it'd be up in the sinus node. So what would we call this? Greater than one hundred and fifty with at the sinus node. Uh, PSVT or SVT? Oh, SVT. Yeah, yeah. supraventricular tachycardia. Right. Sure. Uh huh. So if you remember from the notes you just took a fast, unstable rhythm, what do we do? Fast, uh -oh. fast rhythms. The cardio. Or oh, my man. Perfect. Now, if I needed if he was stable, what medicine would I give him? Starts with an A. So if he's. He's stable, <clears throat> I'm going to give him medicine. What would be my drug of choice? It starts with an A. Oh, uh, Amy. No, the other one that starts with an A. At six milligrams. Adenosine. Adenosine. Dude, I do not use adenosine. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. Okay. <laughs> I, no, but I get it. Thank you for teaching me. I, I just don't use it. Yeah, I won't throw it at you again, my brother. Okay. Uh, let me see here. Okay. Now this. So but adenosine is used for. Atrial. Atrial fast rhythms. Fast. I'm going to write yeah. that down. Because... Yeah. Fast rhythms that originate in the atrium. Okay. Got it, sir. I'm not. I got Perfect. it. Perfect. Awesome, brother. Now it's in there. Okay. Now, I believe this is a block. Now, I need you to see uh, on, on, a, on a, I'll give you a clue here. Look at the PRI. Okay. Yeah. Going, going, gone. Yeah. So, uh, second degree type one. Oh, my man. My man. That's Winky, that's Winky Bach. Yep. Not? You got it, brother. Damn, you are golden, dude. You're killing it. You're killing it. All right. Look at the PRI on this one. Stays constant and all so, of a sudden it just drops. It's second degree type two. Oh, fire. Or how us Cubans say it, fuego. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This one here, the P waves are doing whatever they want, and the QRSs are doing whatever they want. It's third block. degree? Yes, my boy. Yeah. My boy. You got it, my brother. You got it. First thing I want to find out with this patient. Do they have a pulse, right? Yeah, they're dead. Yeah, either they're dead or they have a pulse, right? So right. if they have a if they have a pulse, I'm going to give them medicine. Uh, if they're unstable, a fast rhythm, unstable fast rhythm. What are we going to do for them? Medicine, medicine. medicine. Yes, perfect. What What are we going to do? Pace or or cardiovert? So what is that? Fast. Yeah, we're going to cardiovert. Oh my boy, dude, my boy. Yes, that's a snake. 
<laughs> Bfib, we know this already, right? We already yeah. we already went through your mega code. Yeah, just shock, epi, uh, shock, uh, li- uh, amnio, et, lido, all those meds. This one here, nice straight line, epi, CPR, right? Yeah, nice and easy. Last one here, we get this beautiful rhythm here. <laughs> P waves, QR is complex, is nice and regular, but at the top we look and no pulse, no respirations, no blood pressure. What would this be called? Oh, this is the one that got me before. Yeah. So, oh, shit. Do you remember uh, PEA or pulseless electrical activity? Yeah. Uh-huh, uh-huh. yeah. There's electrical like activity, okay. but there's no pulse, so it'd just sure. be a pulseless electrical activity. Yep, you got it, my brother. Uh, my brother, any questions on anything we covered? There was a tremendous amount of information, bro, and I talk fast, so that makes it even more info, but you did really good with your note-taking, man. Uh, uh, towards the end, when I was asking you your questions, you were able to refer back to them and just nail it, so I think you did really good. Um, if you have questions, look over your notes because I think you took really good notes, and obviously call me with anything you got, brother. If you're working a code and I see you three in the morning, give me a call, dude. I don't give a shit. I'll answer that phone, man. 3 a.m., 3 p.m., okay. whatever you need, brother. I got you, okay? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got it, brother. Uh, and then uh, let me know. Uh, did, did you send payment already? Well, no. Uh, um, just tell me what I need to do. My wife has Zillow. Okay. Is it Zillow or Zell? What is it called? Uh, Z- Zell. 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 Zell? Yeah. Yeah, you so if you go, if you go to, dude, you know what? I've never sent money through Zelle. I think you gotta go. I think there's an app for it. Uh, yeah, and it's it's associated with your phone number. So she said a phone number or yeah. email address. Yeah, my phone number, and you have my phone number, right? Or do you want to? Do yeah, that? the one you've been texting me on. Yes, sir. Uh huh. Is that what his cell is under? Uh, yes. Is that your cell phone under? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's okay. it. Okay. Okay. So here, I'm going to give you his number. You send him the money. Okay. It's right there, that, that text message. How much is it? One, uh, what did I, hold on a second. Hold on. I think I said, let me, let me not misquote you because I don't want to charge you more. PEA is 120, my brother. 120, mommy. Do you feel you you got some good info from that? Man? Yeah, I didn't. Uh, PEA is um is no pulse, but you have electricity. Yes, right? yes, and you actually th- those are actually pretty common, man. I actually a lot of the codes I work uh, are are is that rhythm there, and um uh we actually are doing uh ultrasound in the pre-hospital now in the field they figured out that like 53 percent of all pea patients still had a viable heart like you could see the valves closing circulating blood but not enough to where it can do produce a pulse and we were just calling these patients in the field to where if we kept working them we'd get them back so now we're doing ultrasound in the field of, of the of the heart and uh, uh-huh. we're actually recovering a lot of these patients, man. It's a trip what we're doing. Do you, now. Got, do you guys do echoes out there? That's what you know. No, no. Uh, some countries in Europe do echo, which is insane to me. Out in the field. <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah, that's awesome. That is crazy, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know France and Germany is doing echo in the field, man, which is absolutely just crazy, crazy. Yeah, crazy. it's great. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, I know they have uh surgeons that ride with them and then and then they start the echo in the field that's insane man uh there, there's a lot of crazy stuff that's going to be coming along like pre-hospital like uh, when you call 911 a lot of stuff that we're going to be able to do in the field now so it's pretty yeah, awesome we're, yeah we're using uh video assisted laryngoscopy so we get the glide scopes all the stuff that the anesthesiologists use in, in the in the hospital to like tube patients we now have yeah. that yeah, we're do- it's it's crazy what we do, man. It's it's pretty insane. Our protocol is just growing and growing and growing, and our pays it's decreasing. Awesome, man. decreasing. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, dude, I, I um I'm a I'm a mm, I'm a cardiac nurse. That's so cool, man. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm. I don't work in ICU. I just work. I work straight cardiac. Okay. Um, but the um, um, the pandemic has taught me so much. Yeah. Oh I yeah. Work just just uh 
pulmonary man i've, I've worked when my wife is a critical care nurse awesome That's and awesome. um she had no choice but to when the pandemic started she could she couldn't say no that was her job so um i just volunteered to go to covid floors so she okay. didn't go it alone yeah and uh, what's your name sir fred gonzalez fred frederick gonzalez Freddy. yeah fred yeah freddie gonzalez my wife is an immigrant from Venezuela. Oh, qué bueno, qué bueno. Mucho gusto. Mucho gusto. <laughs> Yo soy cubano y español. Oh, nice. No lo parezco, ¿verdad? No, pero es gringo. Habla <laughs> gringo. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, brother. Yeah, so uh, I know. Uh, what hospital do you work at, brother? I work at NCH. Bro, uh, you guys are making good money on the COVID floors, man. But it's yeah. high risk. Yep. Yeah, I was they, they definitely pay, man. I, I was working sick. I was only taking off Sundays. I... That's crazy. Uh, oh, it, it froze on me. What'd you say? No, uh, I said that that's crazy. You're working six days a week. Yeah. Wow. For probably about a year and a half. I, yeah. I worked uh, sometimes five, sometimes Oof. six, but never less than five. Bro, so like, were you bringing home your money in a Brinks truck or something like that? Yeah, no shit, man. I mean, my wife is a traveling nurse. She shops at the awesome. hospital. That's awesome. So she kills me as far as uh, yeah, as far as wage. That's great, dude. Is That's that great. It? She sent it. Can you see if you got got I the think, money, sir? I think I just got a text here. Hold on one second. Let me see. Yes. Uh huh. Uh, Mimosa Laconte. Oh, that is my most, that that's my charge. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's my yeah. charge nurse. Oh, hold on, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, uh. Mommy, what do you do? Yeah, Fender P Perry Louise. Yeah. F uh Fedner Perry Louise. Yeah. Uh Gulian Morris Morisma? No. no, hold on. No. Hold on, hold on. I just got a text from someone. Oh, Car Car yeah, Carmen Salas. Yeah. Yes. Car yeah, that's my wife. I got it. Perfect. Nice. Awesome. Yeah, there I know is. the other girls. They're the ones who gave me your number. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I work with them at the uh, uh, Regeneron Clinic. Oh, okay. Yeah. They just shut that shit down on me, brother. Damn. What? Um. So you live here in Southwest Florida, too? Yep. Uh-huh. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I live in Bonita. Oh, okay. We live in Cape. Oh, okay. Yeah. I love it, dude. dude they, they, let me tell you, man, the Cape has changed like f crazy, 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 man. Yeah. yeah. They they have um, just revamped that whole downtown area, all the restaurants they yeah. have now and everything.